Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Lloyd Minster Councillor Jonathan Torrens. A vibrant and growing community, Lloyd Minster offers the comfort of rural lifestyle with the convenience of urban amenities. Lloyd Minster takes pride in celebrating together, and their extraordinary sense of community shines most brightly during their renowned public celebrations, including Winterfest, Canada Day, and Heritage Day. Lloyd Minster's natural, cultural, and recreational opportunities reflect the diversity of the only bi-provincial city in Canada. So whether you're new to Lloyd Minster or just passing through, be sure to stop for a photo next to the border markers located at the intersection of 44th Street and 50th Avenue, directly east of the City Hall. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick break with cross-border interviews featuring Councillor Jonathan Torrens. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs. And they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start, if you don't mind, by getting to know the persona behind the councillor's position a little bit. And I've got to ask, where did your sense of duty to serve the border city come from, Jonathan? Well, luckily, uh, you know, you've interviewed several of my council colleagues at this point, and I've listened to all of them. So I knew this question was coming first. So I did my homework. <laughs> uh, you know, for me, it's probably a lot different than the answer that I think you'll get for most people. Um, growing up, I didn't come from a particularly affluent family. Um, my dad was a long haul truck driver. Uh, my mom worked full time as a manager of a retail store and she worked nine to nine every day. And I had three older brothers growing up that were all within five years of me. So back in the 90s, we were uh, we were kind of free reign children, if you will. So we would go out and I would go out on my skateboard every day. And in Lloyd Minster, we had a skate park. It was at Bud Miller Park. And I lived deep into the Saskatchewan side of the city. So it was about a four kilometer trek, but I would go on my skateboard about four kilometers, once there, once home every day. Uh, and I would uh, make use of civic services. There was another period of time in my life where we lived in Saskatoon for a brief period. And me and my brother, because my mom was working full time all summer and we had no childcare, we would just wander over to a paddling pool. So I'm talking like age seven, eight and we'd walk over to this paddling pool where they had you know this service in the Lawson Heights area of Saskatoon and we would just hang out there and hang out and do the programming do the crafts there was no charge no cost so when I look at sense of duty it really comes more from you know to those who much has been given much will be requested of them I feel like I have been a huge beneficiary of programs and services at the municipal level that, you know, it has given me opportunity to, you know, achieve many things so far in my life, you know, becoming a CPA and, and then being able to be back in my community uh, that, you know, I have the ability to give back and hopefully give those nostalgic feelings about a community that I got as a kid growing up and to have those quality programs and services that makes it a nice place to live where when you grow up, you want to move back there. Was politics ever in the cards for you growing up? Did you ever think Jonathan's going to be a city councillor, an MP, an MLA, or prime minister one day? I was not a particularly like good student up until I met my now wife. So 
you know, growing up, uh, I I was a very average student, but very strong willed. And, and I know that I had some teachers who said, you know, he looks like he might be a politician one day uh, based on how, you know, strong willed and a leader I could be. But at the same time, uh, no, I don't think I ever thought of myself as being a, a politician or anything like that I, or nothing. And, and even now, I, I don't even know if I see myself as a politician. Um, you know, often on this show, people talk about local politicians versus provincial and federal. I don't think of myself as a local politician. I'm in local governance, not local politics. What's the difference to you then? Uh, local politics to me is more about being elected. Whereas I focus less on the job of being elected and more on the role of doing my best to provide good government at the local level. Good answer. Good answer. Just clap there for a second there. Um, so for someone self-described, didn't really, wasn't an A student. I can imagine you probably got some good grades, but it was not well off, it seems like. What happened to say 2016, Jonathan's going to run. Jonathan's going to put his name on the ballot. Were there people coming out of the woodwork saying, John, you need to do this? Or Jonathan, we think you were the person that we can sort of rally behind to get you elected. What happened in 2016 to say, okay, it's time to put up or shut up? Yeah, so let's take that point where I met my wife to yeah. another. Because there's kind of a big missing gap there. And when I met her, I decided I wanted to be a good student and I cared about school. I went to university with her in Lethbridge. We moved away. I, I got an accounting degree. I came back. I fired through. I got my CPA right away. Uh, and then at that point, uh, I was working at, a, at an engineering firm as their controller. And, and I just got more and more interested in some of the goings on of, of what was going on in kind of local government and, and things like that. And then there was some huge projects coming up and it was like, well, we're thinking about, you know, going down a different route with our utilities and we're going to start a utility corp and we're going to partner with a, a private firm and basically sell the utilities for a fraction of the cost or whatever to be able to get this wastewater treatment plant built. And then I was just, I was thinking at the time, I was like, you know, there's a lot of really big financial decisions and just looking at kind of the landscape of, of who was on council already and the candidates of who were going there. And I kind of thought, you know what, this is something I might think I would be able to do. And it wasn't someone else coming to me and saying, hey, man, you really, you, you'd be excellent for this position. You should run for council in this next, that didn't happen. And I actually got a lot of advice from people different people I talked to that said, you know, normally it's not someone kind of nominating themselves or feeling like normally it's a calling from the community. And, and to be honest, it was, it was totally different for me than I think a lot of other people's experience. It was, no, this is something that's important that I think I can do as a way to give back to my community. And as a way to represent, you know, young families, sure. And, and all that other stuff. Uh, but also to bring uh, kind of a financial acumen and background to decision making to hopefully get ourselves to a, a position financially where we're better off. Like we were in a really rough spot when I first came in on in 2016, because for years and years, our municipality had relied on land sales to keep property taxes low. We relied on land sales to keep utilities low. Now, all of a sudden, we're looking at the prospect of an $80 million wastewater treatment plant with relatively low rates on everything and, you know, and land sales no longer being there as an option. So having to come up with that long-term financial plan that ultimately the administration does a lot of the heavy lifting, but still uh, providing that kind of leadership and, and good governance and making sure we have the right people in the right roles to be able to take our municipality from where it was to some other more desirable place. So Definitely, it was more on the, I felt I could do it, and that a lot of people believed in me, so. Now, you're elected. Was... Go ahead. Sorry? I was going to no, say, you were. Incredibly... Go ahead. Go ahead. You got it. You go. Okay. I was going to say, you're elected in 2016. You're re-elected in 2020. 2020. You're coming up for re-election, potentially, here, if you've decided to run or not. We'll get to that later. But. I've got to ask this really stupid, odd question, but I think it's an important one here. 
how do you know you're giving good governance? How do you qualify good governance in your heart? Because you have to make those decisions. It's administration giving you the background. It's administration talking to you saying, here's the report. Here's what we think you should do. But at the end of the day, you are that vote. You are one vote on that council who has to decide the path that the city is going forward. How do you do that? Yeah, well, like at the most basic level, even, you know, post 2016, we had like a governance review. So <laughs> we got a report back that said, you know, prior to us being on there, things are a little bit rotten in Denmark and we might have to take a look at how we're doing things and how we're having meetings and how we're sharing information and how do we build trust amongst uh, the elected officials and the team. And then from there is how do we lead by policy and how do we you know, really focus on that one employee rule and, and different things like that. So there's definitely some good governance as far as, you know, being policy makers and policy leaders rather than uh, and, and being more on the strategic and strategic planning side of things. So, you know, to me, that's really where a lot of that focus came from rather than being, you know, boots on the ground. I'm making decisions that maybe are looking at the, the short term because I know they'll be popular versus this is you know some of the bad medicine we got to take so that our municipality can be healthy in the long run so it can be vibrant in the long run and sustainable so that's kind of where i differentiate those things because ultimately we're faced with challenges uh some of which we could take maybe the short-term decision that might be more popular but i'd say good governance is is not being a politician but a statesman not thinking about the next election but thinking about the next generation of who's going to live in this community and making sure that we're setting up not just ourselves for success, but that next council for success. Now, we've only been chatting for about 15 minutes here, Jonathan. Yeah. I, I get a sense that what I'm hearing is the honest to goodness truth. I don't come across that that often on this show where people are just willing to say, you know what, I'm not in it for the next election. I'm not in it for the glory. I'm in it for just basically the here and now and make my community better. Who's your role model in this 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 person I'm speaking to right now? Is there someone that you look back on and you say, you know what? I learned the traits that I'm putting into council from this person. There were a few for sure. Like I, I've been incredibly blessed by having two councils I've worked with now that have done the right things for the right reasons in basically every decision we've made. It sure there's strategic but i'd say very very often it's not political in nature it is this is good government this is what we need to do in the long run it's the hard decision but it's the right decision let's take the right path i think of my parents as being people who have always done the right thing and taken the right path um or at least shown you know how to be principled i've, I've got teachers that i had growing up that you know, had profound effect on me in terms of making sure that, you know, taking the hard path is sometimes just the right way to go. But the one kind of political figure that I've known, and I've watched many of their videos, and even before I was ever even paying attention to politics, is Richard Starkey, local guy, phenomenal guy. Like, if ever there was someone who's just like, well, there's a good MLA that represents, you know, his community and the legislature well, doing all of it for the right reasons like money wasn't an issue he was a, a long time vet and you know and i'm sure financially he wasn't in need of that position or anything like that and and even afterwards i'm sure that he wasn't doing it so he could be on some kind of lobby group or something like that like that that's just not the nature of why he would get into the game it's because he could do a lot for his community and he would do the hard things and he would do the right things and he'd do it for the right reasons um, I have a special place in my heart for Richard Starkey. He, when I was living in Lloydminster, he made my tenure as a journalist at the Lloydminster, the now defunct Lloydminster source, now Meridian source, uh, very uh, easy because he was always accessible. So I, I will, I will agree with you a hundred percent on that. Um, I, I want to, 
Now, you've been on council for almost eight years now, and I can imagine you have probably made some very tough choices in your time because the decisions you make impact the people you represent the day after you make them. You make a decision, it impacts them. You make a decision on budget, it impacts people. And with everything going on in the world right now, with high inflation, the economy in the slumps, oil prices the way they are, municipalities have been trying to figure out the path for it to continue growth, but also to sort of not do it on the backs of residents. Using your CPA hat here a little bit, <laughs> Jonathan, um, has it been easy to make the right choices when sometimes the right choices are the tough choices that are going to impact people? No, not, not in the slightest. So and how do it's you, actually how do you how do you lay your head at night? And I'm not trying to be rude about that question. It's just no, because absolutely. because there's probably people that are going, oh, Jonathan's made my like my taxes are gone up about forty dollars each month or ten dollars each month, and I, that that means I'm not going to be able to pay for groceries this week or I'm not going to be able to buy that extra thing that I need this month. Is it hard to see people suffer when you know you're kind of impacting that suffrage a little bit? hundred percent. And and that, that is the hardest part of the job. That's why it, it is, it is such a difficult time when you look at inflation and you look at, you know, the, the basket of goods that a municipality has to pay for and how those change. It's even maybe relative to a, a normal household that they might change disproportionately. Um, I, I couldn't tell you what bulk calcium or bulk lime that goes into a water treatment plant, what the change in price is from one year to another, but I'd imagine the average household doesn't pay for those things. So having to think about kind of what the effect is of what we do and how it affects businesses and how it affects individuals, uh, that that's the hardest part. Um, and, and knowing that those hard decisions, and, and luckily some of them, some of them we, we were able to do early in our first term, I want to say in 2017, when we really made the, or 2018, one of those two years, we really made the adjustment to, you know, weaning ourselves off of land sales and and raising our property taxes pretty significantly to start kind of fixing that balance. Um, but to be honest with you, the, the solution's not there yet. The solution isn't there yet. I, I firmly believe that municipalities are underfunded from the other levels of government and we're being asked to pay for increasing, you know, increasing higher levels of standards for things like in, including the wastewater treatment plant and don't get me wrong we got a lot of support for for the capital infrastructure but that doesn't change the fact that it costs more to operate it you know what i mean like the operating costs are still more for a mechanical wastewater treatment plant than it was for the lagoon system we had before so it's one side is always advocating whenever we can to to try and get an even kind of split of the overall tax dollars like municipalities in this country, I want to say maintain 90% of the infrastructure in our country on less than 10% of the tax dollars. Does that make sense? Does it make any sense? Yeah, you look at the new LGFF formula in Alberta, and you look at the graph of where it was even five, six years ago. Uh, and it is, you know, I don't know, a third down. <laughs> and we're just meant to absorb those costs on the capital side of things and just move on. Saskatchewan is a little bit different because it, their formula, I guess, is more consistent for us anyways, or it has been, you know, traditionally because it's tied to the PST for the portion that we get. So, you know, but either way, um, it's incredibly challenging to, to know that, you know, every individual in whether you're on the Alberta side or Saskatchewan side is paying proper or personal tax, they're paying corporate tax, some of them. Um, and those dollars aren't necessarily flowing back to their community in the way that maybe I would hope they would flow a little bit better. So on what we do as an individual is we got to find balance. We got to find balance for that future stuff. We got to try and make good investments. Um, one thing that I've advocated for my entire time on council is capital asset management planning. Uh, and and really ensuring that our system in which we do that is more robust than it was when we started uh, so that we can make more intelligent long-term decisions on assets um, so that 
you know, the operating costs are considered so that the capital costs are considered and so that we can rank those things and really focus on balancing wants and needs. But when I say that, I, I don't mean that in the way that you often hear politicians <laughs> say wants, because what some would say are wants, I would say are needs and vice versa in the other way, you know, recreation and having a nice place to live and quality of life. Those are needs. Those are must haves. I, I'm not assuming everything. after seven years, you've realized that 100% of people do not agree on everything. So yes, yeah. wants and needs are always going to differ. And what might be a need to you is going to be a want to somebody else and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it really all depends on the person. But yeah, that's the hardest part of the job is is knowing uh, that your decisions can negatively affect someone's you know financial life. But at the same time, you can also get excellent value for them for the, you know, the tax dollars that you're getting. When you consider how much taxes you might pay in your personal taxes, you don't notice. You don't notice that you paid another $500 this year, because if you paid another $500 this year, that means that you made another, I don't know, $3,000, whatever the case might be. Yeah. So it's, it's different. It's just a totally different tax system. And unfortunately it's really the only one. And we're just not funded, I think, equitably by the other levels of government. So before we turn to the city as a whole, I have one last question in this segment before we do turn to the city of Lloydminster. Um, you, you, you are a unique counselor in, 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 your, in your own right, because you, the city of Lloydminster is the only bi-provincial city in this country. You, you straddle Alberta and Saskatchewan, and you represent people on both sides. Now, I'm assuming, because I've lived in Lloydminster, you do not live on the 50th Meridian. So therefore, you have to live on one side or the other, Alberta or Saskatchewan. When you look at issues in the council chambers, do you look at it as a Lloydminster issue? Or do you look at it as a, okay, Lloydminster, Alberta side issue or a Lloydminster, Saskatchewan side issue? Only reason I ask this is because I've asked every single one of your other counselors as well. <laughs> Fair enough. No, we, we are one community that is in two provinces you know we've got a motto at the city for staff one city one team and uh seamless is like a key word in almost everything that we do because we want to have seamless access to services and seamless quality of services whether you live on the alberta or saskatchewan side uh, you know uh, i've lived on both sides uh, i can tell you that it doesn't really feel all that different to be uh, it, on one side versus the other, it feels quite similar, actually. And and uh, I think it's incredibly important that we do that. It, it's interesting when you look at it. I, I know that when you look at like stats can and from one kind of period to the next to see which one's growing by more than the other or something like that, and you try and pull inferences from there. But at the same time, uh, no, it, it, it doesn't make a difference. We're going to treat you as best as we can and treat you with the highest quality of life as possible, regardless of what area of the city you are on. And even then, I would say we've even made more of a push over the past, I would say, couple of years, because there's some newer developments and things like that where neighborhoods are growing in Saskatchewan, and there's just not nearly as many amenities. Uh, because, you know, Bud Miller Park is such a huge park that so many people get access to on the Alberta side, that we want to move more amenities onto the Saskatchewan side so that I don't know, maybe your kid doesn't have to ride a skateboard four kilometers to go to the skate park. But, you know, things like that. Not that you'd be speaking from experience there at all there. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to turn to the city as a whole now. And before I do this, as I always do on the show, I'm going to preface this question by saying this is a conversation between myself and the councillor. He is one vote on council. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is not a direction of council. This is the councillor's opinion and his opinion alone. But I'm assuming there will be some overlap with some of the conversations we've had previous with some of his other fellow councillors. So councillor, in your opinion... What do you believe is the biggest issue or issue facing issues facing the city of Lloydminster today as of recording this episode? Oh man, there's a lot to be honest with you. Um, the biggest one in the long term is kind of an infrastructure deficit. So when you look at uh, all of our master plans, let's say you're going to add all the master plans up, wastewater master plans stormwater master plan, water master plan, roads master plan, recreation master plan, 
add them all up and you look at where maybe the deficiencies are, and I'm not necessarily saying just the upgrades because upgrades are, are nice, but you know, I'm saying the deficiencies. So like water pools in this area when there's a storm because of, you know, poor design or drainage or whatever has happened, but it's all those deficiencies and everything. And, and we're sitting at, you know, just on our, our municipality alone, like half a billion dollars, like $500 million that, uh, that needs to be replaced. And, and in those master plans, we're talking about over the next 10 or 15 years. And like that number is incredibly large. Uh, and the prospect of having to fund that alone without significant partnership with those other levels of government is, you know, it's just not possible. So things get kicked down the road they get, and this, things don't happen. And then, you know, you, you don't fix those things and they cause deficiencies in another area in your next master plan. So it's just, I'd say in terms of issues for the long term, and that's not something that the average kind of resident might be looking at or about. Uh, but in the long run, I think that that is going to be the biggest challenge to overcome uh, and, and doing less or doing more with less in terms of the, the overall tax dollar and trying to, you know, keep people whole as much as you can in this process and not, you know, overtaxing people or over uh, having too high of fees on things or too high utility fees. So that, that's the biggest issue I see. As of recording this, you haven't passed your but uh, the uh, the sorry the city budget yet have you or have you have oh yeah okay yeah, we, you have we okay we passed in November okay so saying that because I know some municipalities aren't aren't well <laughs> equipped like uh, the city of Lloydminster but at saying that was this a tough budget year for you looking at what you've just said looking at what you originally said in the previous segment about uh the province with lgff with the saskatchewan government not coming to the table the uh, the alberta government sort of reducing lgff uh with federal downloads of costs to municipalities was it a tough year compared to what you originally got into in 2016 when you first were elected has the budget seasons become harder and harder to sort of navigate through okay so yes and no so i'll, I'll start with the no because okay. we have incredibly talented staff at the city of lloyd minster uh now and when i got there i don't think i would have said the same thing and i'm not going to speak ill of any individual but i just want to say that the quality of staff and the quality of the budget process the amount of public engagement and outreach we do um, through the process of getting good information from the public and, and how we actually work that into the budget, all of those things, you know, are better than they've ever been. Uh, so just the ability to kind of be a responsive level of government that actually considers what people want and need or are thinking about in terms of how we set our priorities and being able to do that in a more nimble way, we're better than ever. However, <laughs> there you go. Okay. It's that 10 year capital plan where things are getting moved farther and farther down the road and, and you're having to use uh, tools like debt more than you would like to on things that might not feel right. That stuff, you know, continues to, to put pressure on the municipality. Um, as well as, you know, I want to say that as we passed our budget, and, and I think that it will be we haven't done the mill rates. So as you said, we do spring adjustments once we have the assessment back yeah. normally, but we did have a tax rate and an additional 1% that was voted on as a separate motion that is going to, uh, to deal with the infrastructure deficit that we have. So, you know, there's, there's putting our best foot forward as far as trying to keep costs and increases reasonable, especially considering inflation on a year by year basis and trying to stay at or below kind of the rate of inflation that we would, uh, that we're kind of seeing in our area. Um, and also just trying to make sure that we're not kicking that can further and farther down the road, because we know that nothing gets cheaper as time goes on, especially on the capital side of things, it just gets more and more expensive. Um, and the challenge is that you know, we're, we're sitting in a different perspective, I think, than, than the average person can sit in. And I've done my best over my time on council to communicate that to the public. Just, you know, often you'll hear, you know, it's just there's too many people in City Hall. 
<laughs> and then the issue with with that statement in general, like my my aversion to it, at least for our municipality, and maybe somewhere else, there are too many people. I can't say, but uh, you know the programs as far as getting that capital done. If there's no one there to do the work then you're just making that infrastructure deficit worse. So if you don't have people actually managing these projects and being able to do the work, then that infrastructure deficit problem gets worse. It gets more expensive in the long run uh, to be in that municipality and you know your your programs and services suffer because of it. So if if you don't have kind of maintain at least that, uh, you're just going to get further and further down the road in terms of being, in a worse place as far as your infrastructure goes. Can you give me a silver lining though? I'm not trying to skirt the issue a little bit, but I want just give me a silver lining that the city of Lloydminster is not going to be like, uh, like Mad Max in about ten years. Like you guys oh. are on a, <laughs> on a on a good path, correct? No, 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 no. We are on a fantastic path, okay. and that's what I. Say. We have wonderful people, but it's just hard to communicate that to people because the average. The average person doesn't, they elect you to deep dive deeper than they really want to, right? That's that's why you have an elected official is because it's like, I want someone who's going to go out there and represent my issues and look at all the things that they need to look at to make good decisions and make the best decisions they can for me. John, and that's what we you, do. You, you have opened Pandora's box on this show. I've got to ask that question to you. Do, do you see an apathy within Lloydminster about what goes on at City Hall? I'm seeing less and less apathy recently. Uh, like there's a lot more people who are more interested in just the things that are going on. But I, I think that comes from places of concern and things like that. Uh, but uh, I am seeing people getting interested in what's going on. But it's kind of more of the interested in what's going on, but not really asking a lot of questions. So, <laughs> you know. I've always been one who will respond to, you know, basically any question that he gets, but I, I do struggle with responding to statements um, because it, you know, I, I want to be able to change people's hearts and minds or, or explain things and, and you're not going to get across to everybody, but uh, yeah, definitely there's, there's a level of apathy that exists. And I think that that's probably the silent majority that's apathetic. And then you get that loud, minority that is i would say not apathetic at all <laughs> or if they are ap not apathetic they, 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 they're venting their frustration to the wrong level of government well i think there's a general distrust of government right now just I, i'm sensing that it's it's not just us and it's not necessarily anything we did wrong at this level but there's a general uh at least a percentage of the folks that I don't like government. Any government's bad government. Government does things that I didn't like over the past handful of years. Understandable. Uh, but anyway, I've been talking a lot, but I didn't say any of the good stuff. Lloyd no, is- We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to okay, talk about gonna... that in a few years. We're going to get there, but I just have one last question before we turn to, to the so the good things that the city of Lloyd- Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got to ask the sort of- uh, the change question because you have talked about a lot of macro issues in this episode so far infrastructure funding uh service levels water uh, water treatment uh, sewage treatment plant uh lagoons but the average resident and you just talked about it there's an apathy and they just you you dig into it we're okay as long as my water's turned on and there's uh like my heat turns on in the day i'm happy like as long as my garbage picked up and water's turned on i'm happy but they have micro issues as well they have things yeah, that sure. they be they believe is the most important issue to them. But you know, you have big projects like the things we've talked about already that you have to sort of address as a city council, but you can't forget about the people who have elected you and put you into that position to address their local individual issues, potholes, park upgrades, longer hours at the library, longer hours at the pool. How do you, as councillor, balance the needs of the many against the needs of the few? Yes, I'm quoting Spock for those who are about to send me an email. Yes, I'm quoting Spock from Wrath of Khan. Jonathan, how do you balance that? Can I tell you a secret? <laughs> Go for it. 
it might be because I'm on the younger side of things. Like I was, I was 28 years old when I first got elected to, to council. So, you know, I used to be the young, cute one and now I'm, I'm still on count. Um, so the secret is it must be my generation that I would say is relatively apathetic because my circle and those I surround myself with for the most part, you know, we'll talk about things and I'll use them as sounding boards for different big things going on. And they'll, they'll give me a little bit, of, ah, you're, you're doing great. But to be honest with you, my circle does not really complain to me about things. That's someone else's role on council. I've, I've just never been the one where folks have come to me and said, you know, you're the guy who's going to deal with this issue because you're the person I know. I even know people who know me better who would go to other counselors to bring bad news to them because they were just so happy with the work that I was doing. Like, And I'm not saying that to be arrogant. I'm just saying I am an anomaly. Like, like I said, I don't think of myself as a politician. And I don't think people even in my circle treat me as a politician because they'll often bring their complaints elsewhere. Uh, so when I do get them, don't get me wrong, I, I will do whatever I can to get the information they need if it's missing pieces of information. If it's advocacy on a particular issue, I'll bring that forward. I'll make sure all of council's aware of it. I'll make sure our city manager's aware of it and it gets to the right department if they have to have you know, a meeting between individual A and person at the city B. That I, that I will make sure that that information gets to the right spot so those people have that meeting. Uh, but in general, I, I'm just not the guy for a lot of people that I'm just not the person they want to go to with the, the problems. they. So I've been incredibly fortunate that, you know, even going to the grocery store, I, I'm not the one that gets stopped regularly for whatever reason. I think it's because I dress quite a bit differently, or at least for a period of time, I dress quite a bit differently in council meetings than you see me on the street. Uh, but it's just never been a, a huge kind of part of the role. I well, love doing it. I love engagement, budget engagement. I always get out there and I I, uh, I go to the open open uh, house nights and things like that so that we can give people lots of information, answer questions, carry things forward. But And I like doing that stuff. It's just something where, uh, yeah, I'm not that guy for people. While you might not be that guy, you still have to vote on these issues, though, because other counselors will come with those micro issues saying, 44th street or uh, 15th street on in on in this area of the city is a little bit underfunded so uh i've had five residents come to me how do you look at individual issues or are you trusting the city administration to give you the most accurate information and sort of forgoing what you're hearing from residents whether it be you whether it be your fellow oh. counselors how do you balance that aspect because they want to feel like their property taxes are being spent on them as well as the city as a whole. Oh, oh, for sure. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Now. Maybe it's a slightly different question than the one I yeah. answered. Yes, uh, but, I, I was but, wondering where you were going with that last answer, but I was like, I'll just let him talk for a few minutes. He seems to be joining this conversation. Go ahead. All right. Well, sounds good. But no, but at the end of the day, you got to look at the the community as a whole and those individual parts and pieces and. And, you know, when you've been here long enough, you know enough people in kind of everywhere, in every corner of the town, you know people, and and you'll you'll reach out to them because they don't reach out to me, I'll reach out to them and just kind of, I'll get the feedback that I need to be able to help me to get that decision making. So it's often, it, it goes in the kind of the opposite direction maybe is what a lot of people might think, but that's how I think I've overcome the apathy side of things is is uh, when I need a sounding board, I've got people that I know that I can go to. Like, you know, that's one of the benefits of, of being here in the community for the vast majority of your life, like since birth, is, is you know someone in every corner of the town and you know people who know a lot of people. So you end up kind of making these circles of people where I'll reach out to them and I'll try and get some feedback. Or I've got people who who kind of are a little more interested and I'll see what they're thinking. But at the same time, uh, I do very much trust in our administration and the advice that they're giving us. And I also, you know, I really have a lot of respect for my fellow counselors. I've been incredibly blessed to have uh, counselors that are uh, thoughtful, that are well-prepared um, and respectful so that 
you know, even if I do think I've got my mind made up on a particular issue, I'm always open minded to hearing a different point of view or a different way of looking at things because, um, you know, being persuadable is 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 an excellent trait, I think, is that knowing that you don't know everything and someone else might have a, a particular background knowledge or a particular feeling on something that you hadn't considered yet. So, you know, really thinking of that council as a, as a decision-making team of talented individuals is really, you know, part of that process. I want to turn to uh, the flip side of the original question that I started off with about the issues. In your opinion, what does the city get right? What is the thing that when you go to SUMA, which I know is coming up here in a few weeks as of recording this, when you go to Alberta municipalities conferences, what is the thing that you boast about to your fellow municipal employ, uh, colleagues from across the provinces? Or what do you boast about to your own residents? When you say, when they say, counselor, it just seems like our city is not going anywhere. You say, no, it is. This is why. What are the, what are the things that you point to to say to people, Lloydminster's has got it going on. Yeah, you know what? It's it's hard to put it to just one thing, but there there are many. Like yeah. when you look at the the amount of opportunity that exists in even this just this area of the country, um, you know, there's I've seen studies. I think it was from 2017 that just shows income mobility from one generation to the next to go from the bottom 20th percentile to the top 20th percentile in a single generation. Uh, is the most likely of anywhere else in North America. So like seeing that opportunity and then for us, it's the economic opportunity. So we've, we've had a lot of, a lot of tire kickers and a lot of people, but there's, there's still a lot going on here and there's a lot of growth that's coming in this area. Uh, we're so lucky to be where we are in the world. And, and even, you know, on top of that, it's just like, you've got the facilities, the amenities that we have that are, you know, some of them second to none, the service sports center being one. And all of that is on the backs of on of fantastic people that made that happen and that will continue to make other projects happen. We've got our new arena project coming up uh, and, and we've got great uh, corporate sponsors so far in Synovus that is uh, that is going to be the name sponsor of the facility. And then for our kind of our community arena side, the Lloydminster Co-op is uh, is going to be one of the sponsors. So. You know, when you look at the people and the kind of the the facilities that we've got here, I just think that uh, it's hard to compete with the quality of life that you can have in Lloydminster at the cost that you can have it, the relative cost of living to uh, to overall household income, your ability to get, you know, to wherever you need to be. And I just, I honestly think that you can't, you can't really have a better life. Like, I... I, uh, you know, the reason I came back to live is I, I could have gone anywhere when we were done school. My wife's a nurse. I was an accountant. And it's like, no, those nostalgic feelings I had when I was a kid growing up in Lloydminster, riding my skateboard to the Bud Miller. It's like, no, I want that for my kids. I want them to be able to just wander around town, have a good time and have great public services that they can just go and be kids and, and, you know, have a great life and then move off and go decide where they want to be and one day hopefully come back to Lloydminster because they had such a good time living there growing up. So I am cautious of time here and I want to turn to my last segment because it's my favorite segment and I I want to learn a little bit more about Lloydminster from the through the eyes of the counselor a little bit. In your opinion, what are some of the hidden gems of your community that you would say any tourist coming through the border city needs to stop and see? Well, the first one's not a hidden gem, because if you go on TikTok or Instagram or something like that, you search Lloydminster. And it's funny because individual people were not always very happy about it. But the border markers are like the thing. If you search it, you'll see people just like Alberta, Saskatchewan, <laughs> Alberta. And you know what? It, it is what it is. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool spot to be in two places at once. Uh, other than that, for sure, Bud Miller Park uh, is is always going to be top of mind with all the things that we have in terms of ability of different things to do. I got young kids. I like taking them to the Splash Park. I've got a kid in swimming, so I get to spend a lot of time there. So, um, And besides that, now what's like a hidden gem? I'd say even just 
I don't know, like our trail network, just going for a bike ride down the trail network. It's kind of neat because you go in behind houses, you go out into big open spaces in parks, you go into big parks like Bud Miller. Uh, and, and could it use a little bit more trail networking? Yeah, I think we can do more. And I hope that one day we can uh, make that network even more expansive. But even then, it's just, it's a cool place to be. You can get anywhere in the city on that network. Uh, and yeah, it, it makes it a cool place to visit. Where do you go? After a long day of council meetings, after a long day of work, after a long day of being counselor or being dad, is there a spot in the community you can just go and decompress a little bit? I have a spot that I will not disclose. Uh, but no, there, there is. It, like, I've got a spot with friends where, you know, it, it's... Uh, it's where we go and it's, it's not a club and it's not a, but yeah, it's just a spot where we go in terms of to be adult time kind of thing. But I've got so much family in town too, that I get to spend a tremendous amount of family time. So I've got a brother who lives four doors down. I've got my cousin who lives across the street from that and we've all got kids. So, you know, we get to just decompress together. And on top of that, like specifically right now, when I leave, I'm going to go watch my kid play hockey. Because, uh, you know, that's just what we're doing today. So uh, that it's an awesome time to be able to just sit back, be a dad, hang out. So I'm going to ask the political question now because we are in an election year for Lloyd Minster. Have you made the decision if you're going to be standing for re-election come uh, November of 2024? Yes, I've made yeah. the decision. <laughs> and that decision <laughs> is... Well, there's a long answer to that too. And I know you're already over on time. So it's all uh, depending. It's all depending on let's put it this way. If you walked away in November and said, this is it two terms and I'm done. Would you be happy with the success you've put into council and the change that you've made to the community? I would be incredibly proud of the team we've assembled at the city of Lloydminster and the effect that they are going to have on the city in the long term. Having a fantastic administration that, uh, you know, including our city manager and all the people below them and all the people that they've now trained and the culture change that's happened since I've been on council, I think our city has been set up for long-term success. And really it's the organization I think that, uh, that needed the most work when I first got on council back in 2016. And, and that's where we've had the absolute most success. So, yes, I would be proud. I, I think there's some big projects that we got accomplished and some big issues that we started to solve. We had many, many buildings that needed to be replaced, and we've knocked quite a few of them off. We had a downtown that we wanted to start revitalizing, uh, and we've kind of started on that process and done some of the work to see what the first kind of block looks like. So I, I'm really proud of the work that I've done and the things we've accomplished. So. I could, in theory, walk away in 2024 or be told that you're not coming back in 2024 by the public. And I would still be incredibly proud of my time on council and, you know, the people I got to work with, uh, the counselors and the people I've got to meet along the way. So I'll, I'll leave that question up there. But I want to ask the final question to end this interview. And it's the important one. I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on this show because I think it's a question that every municipal leader knows how to answer. What makes Lloyd Minster such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Yeah, and, and to be honest, I've, I've heard this question every time, and I've thought that every single person who said it has gotten the right answer, uh, especially from the Lloyd Minster folks, because it is the people in Lloyd Minster that really make it unique and special. Uh, whenever there's something that needs to be done or someone in need or someone that needs help uh, or a, an organization that needs to be fundraised or a, a project that needs support, the people of Lloydminster always step up at the end of the day and they always do, you know, the right things, not necessarily the easy things. So uh, I, I'm really proud to be from here and I'm really proud to know uh, many of the people here. So there's no question about it. 
Counselor, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I know we're a little bit over time, but I want to thank you so much for doing this, for sitting down and talking about the Border City. It is my first home when I moved out west, and it will be always, uh, always holds a special place in my heart. I'm looking forward to visiting one after I'm done the Sumer Conference in Regina. I'm going to be driving up that way to go visit some friends and family again. So, well, not friend, family, but friends. So, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and do this. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. This is like my first uh, kind of podcast. So I really thought that uh, that it was special for me. And uh, I'm really glad that uh, that you made Lloyd Minster home for a short time and, and have those nostalgic feelings about it, because the way you feel about it is the way I want the current newsman to feel about it. It's a place he wants to come back and visit, if not move back to at some point. So thank you. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of the top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few months. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, and as always, just keep talking.